uh, senior principal researcher at NICTA for the last year. And um, his main line of work has not uh, always been machine learning. Actually, he has a double degree in ag agricultural engineering, right? And um, he's um, started to fuse these problems with, um, uh, especially, I guess, mostly boosting in this case, right? So um, hopefully, um, we are able to learn a lot about your talk today. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for uh, this invitation. So indeed, I actually started doing computer science in a different field, which was for me uh, agronomical engineering. So and it was rather hardcore uh, genetics in particular, that kind of stuff, and microbiology. And uh, I did a double degree in uh, theoretical computer science as well. So that's kind of different. But at the end, I had to choose, and I chose computer science. I guess it was a, a good choice. And a uh, good choice also because actually uh, it came at that time uh, a model and results on this model that actually were about to spread uh, all the uh, results on boosting algorithms that I'm going to talk about today. And so it's, a, it's an opportunity for me to, uh, to try to summarize a bit why boosting was born this way actually and uh, where it's heading and uh, what are the properties, what, what we can prove about the algorithms, and some future directions as well. So the beginning of the talk would be uh, rather standard. I will uh, just give you some fairly basic definitions, and then progressively, the, let's say, the uh, technicity curve, technicality curve is going to be a bit steep at some point in the talk. And uh, if you have any uh, question, uh, do not hesitate to, to ask. You can either wait at the end of a talk or ask uh, in the talk, or drop me an email if you want for some more precisions about slides and works, papers, theorems, algorithms, whatever. So the outline of this talk will consist of several parts. Um, I will present first, uh, like I said, the, yes? Uh, no, sorry, it's my fault. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> but actually, for the non-technical part, it should be fine. And for the technical part, just stop me and I will go in uh, deeper detail. Um, but in general, I've tried to put any, um, any proof, any technical result just in one slide. So they won't be like uh, with one exception, but otherwise you will have all the content on one slide progressively at least, right? So, but if you have any question, do not hesitate to ask. So the content of this talk will first consist of the uh, origins of boosting, which is the PAC model of valiance. So I will present this model and uh, the way it spread uh, to, uh, to these boosting algorithms. Then I will present the boosting framework, which is actually one very neat and elegant solution to questions raised by the PAC model of variance. I will try to present first one very um, simple to state, at least algorithm, boosting algorithm. And then I will try to generalize the properties of this algorithm to try to encompass more uh, ingredients of learning, in particular in this case architectures, meaning models, representations, uh, losses, meaning functions that we try to minimize when we learn. And I will discuss the property of the losses that typically we would like to use in boosting. I will present the boosting algorithms for these many losses, many representations, present some theoretical results, and uh, I will end with some results that actually escape the original PAC learning framework, very nice results, and uh, which somehow also contributed to, uh, uh, to make boosting very, um, very uh, popular. So in this talk, there are some things I will not talk about, or just very superficially. So in particular, two uh, important aspects of what we can do with boosting algorithms. So I will present in greater detail these notations, 
but you can uh, remember that I will leave intentionally first the approaches to boosting that basically regularize the loss that we try to minimize. Learning for me in this talk will be the minimization of something, a function. So people actually like to uh, add to this function some penalties that typically depend on the representation we are building. So these are the regularization approaches to boosting. I will not talk about that in part because you have a lot of them and it's quite hard to find uh, some common ground for many of them that can be fit in the original boosting framework. That's a bit complicated. Uh, and the other thing is that I will talk uh, about classification problems with two classes only. Just because it's a very simple problem and it's very well posed. And if you want to generalize this problem to predicting more than two classes, then there are different generalizations, different properties, different algorithms. And once again, it's a bit hard to come up with something that would aggregate all that's available into some decent theory grounded in the original boosting model. So these two aspects in particular, I won't develop them uh, in this talk. I will just talk a bit about that. If you have questions, you can ask them, of course. But otherwise, uh, so I won't talk about that. So let's first try to uh, dig down into the origins of boosting and in particular a very particular model which is called PAC. PAC means probably approximately correct. And so you have here a um, recent paper in Siam News about the PAC model and in particular more generally about Leslie Valiant who actually coined this model. And uh, it was uh, in honor of uh, Valiant receiving the Turing Award. And uh, one of his many contributions uh, to, um, uh, for receiving the Turing Award was actually his contribution about the establishment and the analysis of this model of learnability, which at the very beginning was supposed to basically tell whether to, to come up with a model that could fit to the way we ourselves learn. Of course, now it's totally different. But at the be very beginning, it was just about that. In the first papers of Valiant, it's clearly stated, we want to have a model that's going to, to give some computational ground to the way we can learn, right? And try to come up with algorithms that could be implemented in a Turing machine, typically, right? So on a computer. And so the PAC learning model is one very important contribution, so which basically um, uh, from which spawned boosting algorithms and the boosting framework. And there is another model. Uh, I will just briefly mention this model uh, at the end of his talk, which is the, called the evolvability model, which is an, also an extremely interesting model of learnability and evolution, let's say this way. And in the same way as the PAC model brought the boosting algorithms, I think that the evolvability model, which dates back four, five years ago, uh, may be uh, also spreading some very interesting stochastic algorithms. So let's present the uh, PAC model of Valiant. So when we want to learn in the PAC model of Valiant, we suppose that there exists a domain of observations where each observation consists of uh, basically the statement of several variables. So here you can have a three times three uh, board. And uh, so we know beforehand what is the domain, of course. We know the number of variables. We know the values that can take the variables. And this is a two-class prediction problem, meaning we are going to sample or receive observations. And on these observations, we can observe a class, either minus one or plus one. So here you have an example of what is an example. An example is just a couple consisting of an observation, which is just the assignment of this variable. So here you have a particular. You have here a particular assignation of these uh, variable, right, variables which gives you a configuration of, let's say, a game. And you observe also a class corresponding to this observation. 
So this is one example. So you have the observation, the class, among two possible. And the goal in the pack model is to build a classifier. A classifier, in my case, sometimes I will call it an hypothesis, is any kind of function from the uh, domain of observations to R, right, which is computable in reasonable time, polynomial time, for example, and of course implementable on a Turing machine, otherwise it's not very interesting. And uh, for instance, in this case, so I will have again my set of my domain, set of uh, observations with my variables. So this is the input of my classifier. My classifier outputs a real value. So you have a lot of different classifiers. I will cover uh, in this talk I will try to cover a large uh, number of different kinds of classifiers. I feel it's becoming important now with the uh, popularity of particular learning algorithms that are called deep learning algorithms, on which the uh, emphasis is put on the representation, right? Learning the representation is a huge problem in this case. We have very complex domains. So it's basically uh, much better if you, if you can basically tune a highly complex architecture, in these cases, exploiting various kinds of formalism. So in this talk, uh, I, will pre I will use from time to time various kinds of algorithms. You have a first list here, which is actually very standard. You have here the uh, Boolean rules that are called also monomials. This is just some if-then-else uh, rules. For example, you have here, a classifier that says if the first variable, the, so the upper left variable is x, and v5 is x, the center one, and v9 is x, then it's a plus one example, I would say a positive example. Otherwise, it's a negative example, right? So very simple rules, not very accurate in the case of our domain, but still, we can start from that, right? And then progressively build out some more complex classifier. This is actually some very convenient ground uh, classifier, right? And uh, you will have also a course on deep learning. You can also imagine that this, each of these classifiers actually gives you, let's say not a classifier, but a feature, a new feature on your data, right? That you can then aggregate using another kind of classifier, right? You can combine these classifiers. Then we have also another very important uh, set of classifiers, which is very popular in machine learning, that are decision trees. A decision tree simply makes a recursive partition of the uh, domain of observations. So in this case, uh, you have a very simple decision tree consisting of two internal nodes. Internal nodes are labeled by observation variables. And you have arcs here that are labeled by assignations of the variables or test, let's say just uh, test on the variables, right? So in this case, to classify a new observation, you start by the root of the tree and you are uh, progressively uh, going down in the tree until you find the leaf, a leaf, sorry, and you follow the path whose tests are actually evaluated to true for your observation. So if you have a configuration for which the central uh, the central uh, value, right, in your, in your um, uh, chessboard, checkboard. If the central value is blank, in this case, you're going to follow this path. Then you test the value uh, which is at the upper left uh, position. So if, for example, here you have an X, then your tree is going to predict that this observation is negative, minus one. In the case of a game, it, it can be, for example, a, co a configuration that is going to be a lose, a losing configuration for one of the players. And plus one is going to be a winning configuration for one of the players. So a decision tree, you can see that it seems to be a bit more complex than monomials. And it is true, because actually the set of monomials is actually a subset of all decision trees, right? So these are classifiers that are a bit more complex. And so also a bit more complex to, to learn, to induce. I will also consider in this talk linear separators. Uh, a linear separator is just a linear combination of functions, each of which returning a real value. So you can, for example, take a linear combination of these two first classifiers, right? Three times the output of the first one minus two times the output of the second one. You take the sign, plus one, minus one, you have a prediction. 
So here is uh, a class of representation that you can build on top of these two first. But then you can do things a bit more uh, in a bit more complex way. You can have first decision trees in which you are going to replace the tree structure uh, by actually um, an acyclic uh, graph, right? A directed ac acyclic graph. So in this case, you have my tree. I have just replaced one of the leaves and put one arc with this leaf. You can see that it's not anymore a tree. It can also be represented by a tree. That's very important. But it's going to be a bit larger than the representation of this called uh, branching program. So you can think of it as a very compact way to represent at least some sort of decision trees. And the way to classify an observation is just exactly the same as in a decision tree. So there's no difference. Then there is also the class of oblique decision trees. I told you that uh, to craft a linear separators, I can put linear combinations of decision trees. Well, I can just take a decision tree. And in the internal nodes, in test of putting tests on the observation variables, I can put a classifier. And then the arcs will be labeled by tests on the output of this classifier, right? So in this case, you have this, an oblique decision tree here with two linear separators in the internal nodes. And the branchings in the tree are made by taking the sign of the classifier. This could be any other Boolean test. This is just an example. And I insist on the fact, I've not finished with the representation, I insist on the fact that for each of these representations, you have efficient boosting algorithms, right? So for each of these representations, you can find a learning algorithm which satisfies the original boosting properties. And I will present some uh, of them. And as a last example, let's be a bit more complex. So you have this uh, other class of um, classifiers, which is less popular than the other ones, but it has a very interesting feature, which is that it's quite easy to interpret, when at least you are used to using that, and it's a bit compact. So you typically uh, can have on more or less complex problems some simple classifiers, much simpler than decision trees, for example, that can be significantly bigger. So in an ADT, an alternating decision tree, you have so it has the shape of a tree, but inside you have two types of nodes. You have nodes that are labeled by real values, and you have nodes that are labeled by tests. So I have used here just binary tests, but you could replace that by any other form of multi-split uh, test that would be fine as well. So the way you classify an observation is done in the following way. You're going to, uh, to go uh, exactly similarly to a decision tree from the top to the bottom. And you are basically going to sum all real values that your, obs uh, your observation could follow by traversing the tree. The main difference with a decision tree is that in a decision tree, you would follow one path. Here, you, have to, you are going to follow a lot of paths. So we start by the leaf. So we first sum the value of the leaf. And then here, we consider all these free tests, right? So if your observation has x in the upper left variable, yes. So we then add to minus 1.5, we add 0 0.1, right? Then we take this test. If this monomial uh, is evaluated to true, then we add 3.1. If this monomial is, is evaluated to false, false, we add minus 3. And for each of these new internal nodes on which we have arrived, we repeat the same procedure, right? going from the top to the bottom. And we just add all the real values that we encounter. And at the end, we obtain a real value. And the sign of this real value is going to give us the class, which is predicted for our observation. And once again, for all these classifiers, you have efficient boosting algorithms. So I will denote as H this way, the set of hypotheses having the same representation formalism. So inside H, I will put, for example, the complete set of decision trees. I will put the complete set of linear separators sometimes in this talk, 
I will consider not the complete set of decision trees, but subsets of decision trees, right? You will see, I will come a bit later on that again, that this set in particular is a set which is very tricky, and it's not the case of this one, actually. So it may be convenient from a learning standpoint to limit the complexity of the models that we're learning. In the case of decision trees, typically we would limit, for example, the depth of the decision tree, the size of the decision tree, the number of nodes of the decision tree, whatever. Once again, for linear separators, the problem is a bit simpler. I will come uh, back on that later. So, I have uh, talked about losses. Well, what is a loss in general? And what is the basic loss of the pack learning model? It's a very simple one. We take, uh, so an hypothesis, a decision tree. We take uh, an example, so an observation and the corresponding class. And we just measure the disagreement between H and Y. The class Y is in minus one, one. H is a real value. So we are basically just considering the signs of the two values, and which is equivalent. We are computing the disagreements, so to compute the loss, by using the class times the value of the classifier, right? If this value here, that I will call an edge, it's a very important quantity uh, in learning, this value edge, if it is positive strictly, then I know that I'm going to, that H gives the right classification. If it's negative, it gives the wrong classifications. Very simple. So you can plot a diagram with the value of H, which is once again real, right, on the axis, and you compute the loss, and you can see that the loss is going to equal one, because you make one mistake, if H returns a sign which is different from Y, otherwise it's going to be zero. Right, so, so this is the loss computed on one example. And again, it's very important. So far, we just care about the sign because the class is minus one plus one. Why would we care of something more? So to come a bit closer now to the pack model, we have the main ingredients. So we are going to fix the hypothesis class. It's very important. We consider that the hypothesis class is fixed. And we assume that in our domain, so which is all um, times minus one one, there exists a true labeling, which is called in the pack model a target concept. We don't know this target concept, but it's going to give the right label to all the observations of a domain. So typically, you have the domain here. And you have the subset of domain for which the target concept gives minus one. So for which the uh, configurations are losing configuration for one of the player. And the other set of a domain for which the label is plus one. So there is this target concept. We don't know this target concept, obviously. What we can do otherwise, so the, the point in the model was to figure out some very simple mechanism to see what's in the domain. And what is simpler than just basically sampling IID examples from the domain? So we are going to assume that there is a distribution whose support is the complete domain here, O times minus 1, 1. And we are just, again, the distribution is not known in the general case. So what we are going to do, because the distribution is not known, we are just going to ask for examples. And the basis of the pack learning model is that the learner here is just going to ask for examples, as many examples as he can. Of course, there is going to be a very tight constraint on this learner. But so far, he can just sample examples to have access to this distribution, which is unknown, and the true labels that are unknown. So we are just sampling a subset of the domain which contains, let's say, m examples. Throughout this talk, m will refer to a number of examples. It's the size of the sample that the learner has to learn a classifier, right? Then comes the model. So assuming that the target class is fixed, we will say that this target class H 
is pack learnable, probably approximately correct learnable, if and only if there exists a learner, so let's say an algorithm A, such that so this algorithm A has access to sampling the domain. Once again, this distribution is supposed to be fixed, but it's unknown and it can be any distribution. There is no constraint on the distribution. So once again, this is another hard feature of the model, and which is the, what makes also the model so attractive, because we make no assumption basically on the domain. And the algorithm is going to receive inputs. So the algorithm is supposed to know the dimension of the observations, of course. And he is going to receive two parameters, epsilon and delta. And what A is going to do is that it has access to sampling the domain for a subset of examples, which uh, will be called here S, and throughout this talk, S. And first constraint, the size of S has to be polynomial in the size of the domain, and also in these two parameters. We shall, we shall see later what are these parameters about. But it's, this is about classification, of course. So the size of a sample has to be polynomial in basically the dimension of a domain, 1 over epsilon, which is when epsilon is very small, we allow the learner to sample a lot of examples, and uh, idem for delta, right? It depends also on 1 over delta. This is the first statement of the pack model. Actually, you can add some more uh, quantities here. In particular, you can add the uh, relax somehow this requirement, which is very strong, by putting here not only the dimension of the domain, but also the size of the target concept. If the, si if the target concept is very complex, you allow the learner to sample more, e more examples, right? But it's not always put explicitly in the model. So let's put, very, let's put it very simply this way. So your algorithm A outputs a hypothesis having access to all this information. So this, again, comes from the domain. And your algorithm has to return in polynomial time. So this is another polynomial requirement. A hypothesis, a classifier, which actually, whose error will be smaller than epsilon with probability 1 minus delta, right? So basically, ideally, we would like the classifier to have an error on the whole domain here, which is no more than epsilon. But it can be the case that we sample a subset of D, which is going to be not representative of the domain. So we relax the assumption that H must be good. You can imagine that epsilon is going to be very small. So we relax this assumption. And we are going to say, OK, we want this to happen with sufficiently high probability, which is actually 1 minus delta. So what we have here is the requirement on the classifier. One important thing to, to notice is that, first, we use this 0-1 loss, which means that we compute the disagreement between the prediction of the class for the classifier, but we compute it over the full domain again. So this is why delta is here, because we want this to happen with high probability. So with probability 1 minus delta, typically. This is what's given here. Once again, this constraint, we wouldn't be able to require it always. That's, you know, it's fairly simple to show that it's simply not tractable, statistically. But we actually require that with a large probability. You can imagine that delta is going to be very small, right? So it's basically a, a model v with very, uh, very weak constraints on the learner. The learner has to be polynomial time. Well, if it's more than that, we may just never have a classifier. And it's, it's re, it is returning with high probability a classifier which is going to be very accurate on the complete domain. Granted that, again, it has access only to sampling this domain. This is very important. 
So to summarize, a pack learning model satisfies two constraints. The first one is a polynomial complexity, polynomial time for the algorithm and polynomial size for the sample of examples that is uh, uh, drawn from the domain, and outputs on hypothesis which has small true error, so this is the error complexity of the whole domain, with high probability. This is the pack model. So we have two requirements. One computational requirement, one statistical requirement. It turns out that these two requirements have a very, very different difficulty in this model. And we'll just briefly talk a bit more about that. So the basic strategy, and when you look at all the uh, early results, not only the early results, in the, pack, uh, in the pack model, the positive results, the basic strategy is, the high level strategy is always the same. So you are going to find a polynomial time algorithm, of course, which is going to have access to a learning sample S, and which is going to output a classifier with reduced empirical risk. We are not going to focus on the domain. Basically, we don't have access to the domain. We are just requiring that the error of the classifier on the training sample is small. And here, I mean very small. Actually, in many cases, we focus on algorithms that would output a consistent classifier, which means a classifier that makes no error on the training sample. This is the basic strategy, and the intuition is just that if your classifier makes no error in the training sample, then perhaps on generalization, it's going to be not bad. Of course, this is a very short message. Actually, the, the, uh, the truth is not exactly that. But actu actually, it's very intuitive, so let's keep that message so far. And of course, to satisfy the constraints of the PAC model, we suppose that the algorithm is able to sample enough examples, right? So I've put basically the computational complexity requirements in this color, kind of reddish, and the statistical requirement in this color, a bit yellowish, right? So throughout the beginning of this talk, these two colors will refer to the two constraints. So we just sample enough examples, which, of course, in practice, we don't necessarily have access to, but it's, it's good to imagine that, because otherwise it's quite difficult, actually. And what happens is that if you obtain this kind of algorithm, then, indeed, it can be a pack learning algorithm, provided you sample enough examples, and actually, the bound given here is fairly tight, uh, at least in some cases. Uh, the bound just says that you are going to sample a number of examples, which is at least a constant times, 1 over epsilon log of 1 over delta. So these are the two parameters, the two statistical parameters of a domain. So intuitively, you can see here that the requirement on epsilon is actually much stronger on the bound much stronger than the uh, requirement on delta. And we shall see that indeed what causes the problem is actually this parameter better than this one. Because to reduce delta, you just have to uh, basically infer classifiers, right? And be able to test them. So you have also another part in this lower bound, which depends on epsilon and on a quantity which is measured. Oh, there is a little typo. This is the H big H here a quantity which is computed over your whole set of classifiers, not just H, right? It should be big H, the other one, which is called the VC dimension, the vapnik chervon and Kiss dimension. I will come back a bit later on this notion. You can just keep in mind that this notion characterizes the, let's say, the complexity, meaning the richness, right, of your class of classifiers. The richer your class, so the more complex you can make classifications with this kind of classifiers, the, more, uh, the larger number of examples you are going to have to sample, right? So as to make sure, basically, that this classifier, which is good on training, is also going to be good on testing, right? So basically, very simple strategy. We find the polynomial time algorithm, which, is, which returns a consistent classifier. We sample enough examples. Right? So we have this statistical requirement 
because this is about the statistical requirement. You can see the statistical parameters here. Statistical requirement, easy. We just have to, pu to push the button a sufficiently large number of times. The problem in this model is the computation time. And very early, you had a lot of results that were aggregating not positive results, but negative results. And it's very uh, nicely summarized in this part of a, of a talk, uh, which basically says most of the difficulties in pack learning are due to the computational difficulty of finding a hypothesis in the particular form specified by the target class. Right? So the computational difficulty of the model sometimes just wipes out the ability to have a pack learner for a large number of hypotheses, uh, of classes of representation. For some classes, it's actually very easy. If you take, for example, the monomials, it's very easy to state a pack learning model for monomials. If you take the complete set of decision trees or the complete set of disjunctive normal forms, disjunctions of monomials, right? In this case, it's much harder. And actually, for many of these classes, it's still open. So there is something about the difficulty of the computation to find a good classifier on your training sample, which just wipes out any potential learning algorithm for a large number of classes. And when you look, what is really bad, actually, is that when you look at what's happening in several cases, well, the picture is its a bit worse than that, actually. Because if you consider, so I'm going to try to operate that. Yes. So in this case, so you have here this schema here on the left. And I'm going to put on the right some examples. So this, uh, this schema represents here a complete set of classifiers, for example, the complete set of decision trees, the complete set of disjunctive normal form formulas, so DNFs. Right? So once again, a DNF is just the disjunction of monomials, right? So you can express, if you have two classes, you can express any labeling of your domain with a DNF. You couldn't with just, with, uh, with just a monomial. And what you have in this case, so you have the class of monomials, which is a subset of DNFs, right? It's a DNF with just one monomial. So you have here monomials at the bottom, very simple class. And you can try, well, to replace the constraint, I want one monomial, it's pack learnable, great. Well, I don't, I don't want one, I want two. Okay, so I just want a disjunction of two monomials, right? So this is called a two-term DNF. Is, does there exist a pack learning algorithm when I just replace one monomial by two? No, actually, if you take this superclass of monomials, two terms DNF, if you have a pack learning algorithm for this, this class, actually P equals NP. Right? So it's not just to say that the task is a bit hard because of some reasons, it's, it's just like it's extremely hard. Right? So, you can, of course, then increase the complexity of your class, replace the requirement, okay, I don't want two. Let's say I want k. k, where, where k is not going to be a large value, for example, 10, or for example, d, the number of features, right? Intuitively, it's better because we can represent more concepts. So it could be k equals d, or we could just uh, 
increase this a bit more. Let's say k equals d squared. And we make this way a progression towards covering the complete set of DNFs, which basically, again, can represent all, represent all, cla all, classification, all classifications over the domain. So the question is, for D, so again, we relax the constraints on the number of monomials. We can say, OK, that's going to be easier. No. And we can relax a bit more, d squared. No, it's not going to be easier. And you can try to approach, right? So here, dnf is just 2 to the power d term dnf, right? Because if you put, if you just encode your list of examples, right? Then you are going to encode the complete domain, and you, you can represent it with this kind of DNF, which is huge. Okay? Below, of course, it's so huge, it's going to be exponential to infer this kind of formulas, right? But if you come just a bit closer to that, let's say k equals any polynomial in the dimension, Remember that in the PAC model, you want the number of examples to be polynomial in D. So typically, you're not going to be able to induce much more complex formulas, right? In this case, the answer is still no. And what is happening is that you can, you can, you can say, OK, perhaps it's the polynomial time requirement in the model, which is not good. Let's relax that. So without coming to exponential, you have a wide gap between polynomial and exponential. We can just re request the complexity to be of, let's say, d to the power of polylog quantity of d, right? So this is called qp. So you can say, OK, we are not going to request an algorithm of polynomial time, but of quasi-polynomial time. This is the definition of this class, deterministic still, right? And say, OK, now we are going to have an algorithm so if we relax this assumption, perhaps we can actually ask for DNFs a bit larger. So we can perhaps request DNF whose size is going to be d to the power log k of d, right? Is that possible? No. And for the same reason, because otherwise you would have NP which would be in QP, which is also in the same way as we don't believe that P equals NP, we don't believe that this might happen as well. Right? So basically, there is no hope for an algorithm that would learn any interestingly interesting subset of DNF. Right? No such pack algorithm. And so you have the summary here. So basically, if you start with monomials, that's cool, it's possible. That's blue, it's pack learnable. If you increase the complexity by increasing the number of terms, it's not going to work, right? And it's really red because you are facing the worst possible complexity assumptions. And above here, it's not known for many uh, classes of representation. So you have a very nice uh, presentation of all these results in a, in, in a PhD, actually which is the, the PhD of Vitaly Feldman, uh, who is actually a former student of Valiant. So you have a lot of, uh, a lot of a very interesting bibliography, very interesting results on this kind of problem, on the PAC model. What, what is achievable on the PAC model when you want to learn from very large classes, right? And it turns out that the picture is very negative. So what can we do? Is there any workaround for the PAC model? And actually, the workaround came from basically, it's a bit more subtle than that, but basically, we relax the assumption that we are learning a concept which belongs to the same class as the target concept. We are going to say, whatever, we are just learning a concept. It's going to be a linear classifier, right? 
We don't care about whether the target concept is as big as a linear classifier or smaller. We are just going to use a linear classifier or a decision tree. We don't put constraints. We make no link between the hypothesis concept and the target concept. This is called improper path learning. Right? And in this case, well, the first, let's say, statement of the workaround was uh, given in a machine learning class project in 88. And, well, there is no result in here, but there is a very important question that you can find also in several papers at the same period. And so we present initial modest progress, very important, on hypothesis boosting problem. So this was the first time, basically, that the problem was stated very formally and very intuitively, which is basically whether if you have an efficient learning algorithm, so in the distribu distribution-free model, we don't want to relax this assumption. It's a very important one. We make no assumption about the domain. So assuming that this algorithm returns a hypothesis whose performance is just not smaller than epsilon, but just slightly better than random, right? Does that imply the existence of an efficient algorithm that would output a hypothesis of arbitrary accuracy, equivalent, equivalently a hypothesis of arbitrarily small error, pack model, typically, right? So assume you have a black box, which I will call a weak learner, which just written some classifiers that are just modestly more accurate than the toss of an unfair coin, right? Can I use this black box to learn a classifier which will comply with the requirements of the pack model? At first sight, well, what is funny about this is that at that time it was mentioned the resolution of this question is of theoretical interest and possibly of practical importance. Well, that's very funny when we know actually what happened after because now today basically the practical importance in computer vision, for example, is widely recognized while the theoretical questions about that, you, you wouldn't see them anymore in the papers, but it's very important to understand how you craft a boosting algorithm. So. What is very important here is that you have a black box which returns classifier and you want to aggregate these classifiers. You make no assumption about the representation of the true classifier that gives the labels to the example, right? You remove this assumption, we make no assumption about that. We want to use this weak learner and infer a classifier that's going to be arbitrarily good on the complete domain again. So the other requirements are the same, exactly the same. Nothing else changes. And this was formalized in the model, the model of weak and strong learning. So we are going to make, I'm going to make the assumptions and the property a bit more formal now. We make the assumption that, okay, so we have a particular hypothesis class, which is called the weak hypothesis class, HW. And we assume the existence of an algorithm AW. This algorithm is a pack learner, but only not for any epsilon. Only a pack learner for epsilon equals one half minus gamma, right? So it's just slightly better than random coin, because in this case, gamma would equal to zero, would be equal to zero, right? And we are going to relax that even further. Let's try to relax that even further. Gamma is not a constant. Now, usually we consider gamma is a constant, but actually it's a quantity that decreases with the problem's parameters. So gamma is allowed to be an inverse polynomial in the dimension of a problem in many parameters that you can put inside depending on the class of classifiers that you want to learn. Okay, so typically, when your dimension increases, you are going to relax even further the constraints on the weak learner. So you have your domain, you have your true target concept, your weak learner here, AW, takes a sample, it's a pack, algor pack learning algorithm, re returns an hypothesis HW, which is going to be very bad on the domain, but its true risk on the domain is going to be 
no more than one half minus gamma, and this again with probability one minus delta, right? We don't forget that. I don't put in the slide to, in order not to lay down the slides, but this is basically the requirement. We we'll drop epsilon, replace it by one half minus something which is one over a polynomial quantity. And actually what we could do, we can think that, okay, this is going to be uh, very weak, indeed. We, we have relaxed, relaxed somehow the most, the requirement on epsilon. Well, we can do more. Let's, requ let's relax the requirement on, on delta as well, right? Because delta is still given. It's any uh, value in zero, one. So let's put that, you know, delta is going to be, again, so it's not uh, gamma, actually, it's one minus gamma. So let's require this weak hypothesis with a very, very small probability, not a very large probability, right? Let's just require it with a very small probability. And let's actually replace the requirement on epsilon, saying, okay, that's good that we want the true risk to be lower than one half minus gamma. Well, what if the error was greater then one half plus gamma. This gives you actually a classifier, which is not bad. If you take minus, if you put a minus in front of the classifier, you're going to have a classifier whose error is actually no more than one half minus gamma, right? You just change the polarity of the prediction. So let's put all that in a setting in which we are going to require the true risk of the weak classifier to be different from one half by at least gamma, right? Given again that one half is just the toss of an Andreas coin. So let's relax all these parameters. <coughs> and the question is, when we look at strong learning, does this imply the existence of strong learners? So once again, my strong learner will be denoted AS, S for strong, and I will use this kind of dark blue to denote a strong something, right? And light blue to denote a weak something. So we want a strong learner that's going to output with high probability and a hypothesis whose error is going to be no more than epsilon with high probability. And the answer is yes. Yes, this algorithm exists. So you had the first paper in the early 90s which actually gave the algorithm Right? It's a constructive proof. It does not say this algorithm exists. You have the algorithm in the paper. The problem is that it's not very practical. It's very hard to implement, actually. But the message is in this paper is actually uh, that it hacks the shape of the strong learner. L you look at the paper and you look at all the boosting algorithms, formal boosting algorithms that, that were published afterwards. They basically all share the same property. And this shape is very simple. So you have your weak learner here, which is independent from the strong learner. You are basically going to embed in the same domain, both the domain and the strong learner. So the weak learner is going to see some examples, but the examples are going to be biased by the strong learner. And this way, the strong learner is going to exploit somehow the weak learner. Boosting is a game. I will talk a bit about that. To exploit the weak learner to obtain the classifier that he wants. So we use the weak learner. How do we use it? Well, so remember that AW is supposed to be a pack weak, pack learning algorithm. So we have to provide AW with a, val a value for delta, right? So this is not very hard. Typically, the strong learner gives to the weak learner a subset of the, learner, of the training sample. This can be the complete set. This, this can be a subset. We will see different examples. And what is crucially important is that it's going to compute a particular distribution over these examples. And it's going to exploit the fact that, OK, this algorithm, this algorithm is weak, but it has to be weak for any distribution. Right? There is no distribution for which it's going to return a coin. Right? It is forced to return a classifier that's moderately accurate. We are going to exploit this fact, and this is the central point in boosting algorithms. 
So basically, the weak learner, after having been inst instantiated with a first set of examples, first distribution, is going to output a classifier, a weak classifier, back to the strong learner. And we are just going to iterate through this uh, execution of the weak learner, getting weak classifiers back, and at the end, typically, the strong learner is going to craft an aggregation of all these weak classifiers, and this classifier here, after a certain number of iterations, so you can imagine it can be much more complex, this classifier is going to, to have, with high probability, a true error, which is going to be no more than epsilon, for any epsilon. And in general, of course, we get this feeling with uh, this kind of process. In general, the subset, the set of hypotheses that the weak learner can output is actually very small. And in general, it's actually a, a subset, a strict subset of the hypotheses that is used by the strong learner, right? Sometimes, I will uh, come back uh, on that later, sometimes actually the uh, set of weak classifiers is just so small that you, then you can just uh, sample all the different classifiers in here, right? So for applications, this is what's, what's actually uh, usually done. So it's very, very small, so you can, met, you can make an exhaustive search in this set. Okay, so this actually defines boosting as an iterated zero-sum game over edges. And I'm going to present some boosting algorithms afterwards, so I will make this uh, notion a bit more precise. One important thing here is that this game is actually held over edges. The information that is used between the strong and the weak learner, which defines the way the strong learner is going to work, this information is the edges, right? So, the key points about this scheme is that all classes of representation I have presented at the beginning, all these classes, there is no exception, they can be boosted using exactly the same scheme the same scheme. And I will show you that, actually, for several of them. And there is absolutely no difference. So in practice, again, the number of weak classifiers is very small. Typically, it's something that's not bigger than the uh, dimension, for example, the set of features, right? So you can easily implement the weak learner. Remember that the weak learner in the model is a black box, but in practice, you have to implement it. Usually, we assume that this uh, weak learner is going to be very simple to implement. We just compute an exhaustive search over a small set of classifiers. Typically, we would pick just the observation variables. We can go a bit higher by computing decision stumps, decision trees with one internal node. Or we can go a bit higher computing decision trees with a fixed uh, bounded depth. But in general, that's not, mo not much more, right? And so what is interesting in this scheme is that so you have a weak learner that outputs classifiers that are aggregated by a strong learner. Why putting two classes of representation? You could actually have not just two, but a hierarchy of classifiers with which you would come up with complex structures. The weak learner would return classifiers to a first strong learner, different formalism. This strong learner, I call it strong, but actually it would be a weak learner for the next one that would aggregate this classifier in a different way, right? And then you could stack all these weak from strong algorithms and obtain some very complex uh, structures for which you would still be able to prove the result that was proven in the original paper of Shapiri. Right? You have to be careful about some parameters, but basically, uh, at least for the, the, we shall see, the convergence of the algorithm, the scheme is, works always the same. So it's very simple. So for example, 
consider that your weak learner is just returning an observation variable. Very easy to implement. You just make an exhaustive search. You can imagine that your first strong learner is going to be a decision tree. So basically, you're going to grow in a top-down fashion your decision tree, starting from an empty tree, and then adding, replacing leaves by uh, internal nodes, little splits. Each split is built over one of these variables. So you typically ask the weak learner for a split. Right? But then you can also assume that there's going to be another strong learner which is going to induce linear separators. Linear separators based on the output of this one. And you have a scheme which is actually very common, which is the scheme that you would see, for example, with ADA boost, which is one of the most, if not the most famous boosting algorithms, popular boosting algorithms, which is just a linear combination of decision trees. So in this case, you consider that the weak learner returns features or decision stumps, very small trees. First, strong learner which builds a decision tree from these stumps. Second, strong learner that computes a linear combination of decision trees, right? From the previous strong learner. What happens? if you switch the two strong learners, right? In this case, what do you have? You have here, still your weak learner, we will keep it because basically you want something simple to implement. So the weak learner doesn't change, but this time we have the first strong learner that's going to learn a linear separator, exploiting the weak learner, okay? So the weak learner is just going to re return variable, variables. And we have another strong learner here, which is this time going to use a decision tree based on the output of this one. What are the representations that you build in this case? It's not a linear combination of decision trees. This is just an oblique decision tree. It's just a decision tree in which at the internal nodes level, you have linear separators to decide the path of an observation, right? So if you have, if this algorithm here and this algorithm here, the first strong learner, the second strong learner exist, and they do, of course, then you have actually a very simple algorithm to induce oblique decision trees, as well as linear combination of decision trees, right? So it's just basically permuting the roles of the strong learners. So let's have a look at, not at the first algorithm by uh, Shapire in the early 90s, but let's say, let's have a look at the first implementable, and actually very easy to implement algorithm, boosting algorithm, which is ADA boost. So I'm going to give you the statement of the algorithm as well as the proof that it's a boosting algorithm in one slide. So basically I'm going to accumulate uh, bits and bits of equations, but the main part of it is the algorithm, of course, which consists in, once again, repeating for a certain number of iterations the call to the weak learner. Each time we instantiate the weak learner with basically the same set of examples. There's no modification. We don't, we don't filter uh, examples in this set. You can do that, but in the first algorithm it wasn't done. But at each iteration we are going to instantiate differently the set of weights. So we are going to have the weak learner see a different distribution. And we know that regardless of the distribution, the weak learner will have to return a classifier is going to be slightly better than random. Then, after we have received this classifier, which outputs minus one one or a real value, that's not important in this case, we are going to compute a leveraging coefficient. And the leveraging coefficient is going to be, in the case of ADA boost, the average, because here it's computed over the training sample, the average not over the initial distribution, but the average over the biased distribution here of this function. This function, I will call it the exponential loss, right? Not the zero one loss. This function here takes as a parameter the alpha that we want to compute, obviously, but re remark that it also takes as a parameter the edge. Again, so once again, the edge is here. And so given this classifier, we are going to compute the value, the leveraging coefficient for this classifier, which minimizes uh, 
the average exponential loss, not the zero one loss. After this operation, which is extremely easy to do if your classifiers uh, return a value which is in minus one, one, extremely easy, you have a closed form. If it's not the case where you can still approximate this solution, if, you, if you're not happy with the approximation, you can actually replace that with another computation, it's in the bibliography, that would give you a closed form solution with the same guarantees on the final algorithm. So there's nothing uh, to be scared about with this kind of minimization part. It's actually very easy to do. And then, after having received the uh, weak uh, classifier, after having updated the leveraging coefficient, we just update the weights. And how do we update the weights? This is going to be a feature that's common to many different, perhaps all boosting algorithms, formal boosting algorithms. For each example, so uh, this is here Hadamard multiplication. I've used the vector representations here. So it's just uh, coordinate-wise multiplication of the two vectors, right? Which gives you a vector, right? So for each example, we are going to multiply its weight by the value of the current exponential loss on this example. What is happening? Well, assume that the classifier here is giving the right class to the example, right? And alpha doesn't change the polarity of the classifier, which means alpha h also gives the right class to the example. What you can see here, alpha h, the sign of alpha h is actually the same as y. This quantity here is going to be positive, this one negative. This one is going to be smaller than one. The weight of the example is going to decrease. Right? So if your example receives the right classification, in the next set of weights, which is normalized, in the next set of weights, relatively speaking, its weight will be smaller. So what the strong learner here is doing is actually it's putting more emphasis on the examples that are hard to classify. And it's giving that back to the weak learner, and he knows that he's going to have a classifier that's going to be slightly, slightly better than random. Right? So he has the right to do that, and it's not going to change the properties of the final classifier. And at the end, speaking of the final classifier, we just compute a linear separator, which means we just make a linear combination of the weak classifiers, and if we want to, to have a class, we just take the sign of this output, of this classifier, right? So, how can we analyze this algorithm, and why is it a boosting algorithm? Well, in the case of Ada Boost, that's really simple to show. You have two steps, basically. The first one consists in showing that on your training sample, your error is going to decrease very fast to consistency. It may be a bit counterintuitive, but actually, even with this kind of weak classifiers, the training error of your strong classifier is going to decrease actually exponentially fast to zero, right? So you're going to have very rapidly a consistent classifier. Remember what I said about the, the pack learning model. You obtain a consistent classifier. You sample, yes? So the question is, what about the variance? That's actually a good question, but not from this standpoint. Because so far, we are just interested in the minimization of the true or indirectly the empirical risk, which is just the expectation, right? So we don't go further into the moments, but actually there are some things that are happening in experiments that actually justify to take into account other parameters. I will talk a bit about that later. But so far, let's get stick to this very simple objective to minimize the true risk, right? Just an expectation, right? So in this case, I have another answer actually, which is in this case, if, right, you see that the weight is going to put more emphasis on the examples that are hard to classify, right? So intuitively, and actually, it is the case, even if I won't write it, the next classifier, 
cannot be not only the same as the previous one, because it's going to be very bad. Actually, if your weak learner returns the same classifier a second time, this is going to be a non-bias coin. So it can't return the same classifier. So total correlation, it's impossible. Right? And even, let's say, strongly correlated uh, hypothesis, it's not possible. Right? But weakly correlated, yes, that's possible. But then other problems come. But from this focus, we want to minimize the true risk. This is actually enough. We just need that. And in this case, what we can show is taking the update rule, we can easily show that the exponential loss of a one example computed over the final strong classifier is going to look like, well, so far it's maybe a bit cryptic, the product of the normalization coefficients, well, times here the initial distribution, which is just uniform. Right? We can tweak a bit this distribution, but uh, normally there's no reason to do that. So it's just uniform. So the loss on one example is just the product, basically, of the normalization coefficients. Right? And we are iteratively minimizing, you see that here, minimizing this exponential loss. So why should it be good to minimize, actually, the true risk, which does not rely on the exponential loss, but on the zero one loss? Well, it turns out that the exponential loss is actually an upper bound on the zero one loss, which is good, but it's not any kind of upper bound. It's actually an upper bound, and you can see here that if your argument is greater than zero, your exponential loss here implies that you will receive, your example is going to receive the right classification, right? So it's not just any upper bound of the zero one loss, and we shall see later what it means to be good for such a, a kind of loss. It's not just any loss. It's a loss that upper bounds the zero one loss such that it gives a precise indication in this form on whether the example receives or not the right classification, which is again our objective. Right? So we are minimizing this quantity, which turns out to be the product of the normalization coefficients. And what we get, but which is actually central, what we get is just that the empirical risk this time, so we are starting to make the link with the true risk, the empirical risk is just as well upper bounded by the product of the normalization coefficients. Right? It turns out, and I'm going to develop that a bit, uh, a bit more, it turns out that if your classifier here is a bit better than random, each of the normalization coefficient is going to be smaller than one. Okay? And therefore, and in not any way smaller than one, in a very particular way, such that making this product will grant you exponential convergence towards, towards what? Towards consistency, because you have a finite set of examples. Assuming the uh, weight distribution is uniform, uh, when this here is smaller than 1 over m, your classifier is consistent. Right? So you are going to be exponentially uh, fast progressing towards a classifier that's going to be consistent. Why is that so? Let's start again from this inequality. So once again, the true risk, we forget about the exponential, the, um, exponential uh, risk, the true risk here is just the product of the normalization coefficients. I'll try to make the distinction between the loss, a loss and a risk. A loss is the quantity that you have in the expectation. The risk is just the expectation of a loss, right? So in this case, our zero one empirical risk, it's also his name, is just no more than the product of the normalization coefficients. Right, so assume that your classifiers here, your weak classifiers here, return a value in minus one one. Minus one one, not necessarily exactly minus one one, because it may be hard, in the interval minus one one. Okay? In this case, well, we can still explicitly minimize this equation. Uh, 
but it may take some time, right? So let's assume we approximate the solution by this quantity, right? Which is not going to be always the minimum, but it's going to be a very good one, actually. Because if you pick this value, so what is this value? This value is one, one half the log of one plus the expected edge of uh, the current distribution divided by one minus the expected edge. Again, again, this edge is, the expected edge in particular, is the key quantity to compute the update, right? So what do we have? So assume we pick this value for alpha t, easy to compute. The optimal value of z, actually, so the one that would be achieved for the optimal here, is actually no more than this quantity, which is just the quantity that you would have considering a convex function and upper bounding the convex function there we go, by Okay, my right here. Upper bounding your convex function by this line segment here, which is exactly what you have here. When you compute the value of f on minus alpha and alpha, you have exactly the upper bound. So we just upper bound this convex function by a linear function. And we are going to put the explicit values of alpha. When we put the explicit values of alpha, this is what we get for one normalization coefficient. One normalization coefficient is no more than the square root of one minus, again, the expected edge squared. Right? So you can see that a necessary, a sufficient condition for z to be smaller than one is that this quantity is different from zero. Right? And we shall see that this quantity is zero only when you have a non bias coin. So, to work a bit more the bound, we are going to upper bound this quantity by this one, which is just exploiting the fact that y minus x is no more than exponential of minus x. Okay? So, we just put the square root, one half here, and that's done. And this way, when we compute, here it is. This way, when we compute, this time, the expected empirical risk of your strong classifier, I should put the S here, then we make the product of all these bounds on each of Z, and what do we have here? We have something which is an exponential of minus one half, the number of iteration times the minimum edge squared. Right? So, if this quantity is different from zero, and assume it's going to be different from zero from at least some, let's say, gamma. In this case, this is going to converge exponentially fast and exponentially fast towards consistency again, right? Because when this quantity here is typically smaller than the smallest weight, smallest weight, sorry, in your training sample, your classifier is consistent. So, let us summarize all that. What is the boosting algorithm in the original framework? So far, I have just a classifier which is consistent on the training sample. It's not a boosting algorithm uh, in the original model. But actually, it's very simple. We have this weak learner. We are going to fix the delta of the weak learner to be the delta of the strong learner, right, divided by t this way we are guaranteed, right? It's just the union bound. We are guaranteed that with large probability, one minus delta S, pack constraints of the strong learner. We are going to have here, for any iteration, a weak classifier whose expected risk of the bias distribution is going to be no more than that. I put the twice here to have a short equation. So basically, this quantity is going to be bounded away from one half, right? which is, again, the weak 
learning model. But what is nice is that if you assume that your uh, weak classifier returns a value in minus one plus one, then this quantity is no more than one minus the expected edge. So what you have is that the expected edge squared, remember that this is what we wanted to lower bound to be guaranteed that the uh, rate of convergence would be exponential towards zero. The lower bound on the expected edge is four times gamma squared and gamma is strictly larger than zero, right? So the expected, the, the empirical risk of my strong classifier is going to be no more than that. Okay, so now the bound is a bit easier to read. So it depends on T, of course, and of gamma squared. No big deal. Now, suppose that we are going to, you make a sufficiently large number of iterations. In this case, it's not very large, actually. You make a number of iterations, which is actually going to be larger than one over two gamma squared log M. So it's even logarithmic in the number of examples. So in this case, assuming that your distribution in your training sample is uniform, again, you obtain a strong classifier that is consistent. And when you exploit the results, actually, I've already slightly alighted at the beginning, right? When you take a number of examples, so this number of examples is sampled by the strong learner, right? These are the examples it's going to give to the weak learner. When you sample a sufficiently large number of examples, and look, it's not a big number, actually, then, actually, your strong algorithm is going to be a pack learning algorithm in the original model of Valiant, right? So the statistical part is basically just ensuring that, right? And this is just the size of the uh, hypothesis space of the weak learner, which is typically just the number of description variables, just because here, normally, you would have the VC dimension, right? Which, in the case of linear separators, is just the dimension plus one, right? So typically, it's the order of the number of different variables. If you use, as weak learner, right, an algorithm that just returns a variable, very easy to implement. Okay, so if I summarize, so AdaBoost is a strong, also a pack learning algorithm with some key features. So you have here the strong learner. There is a parameterization of a strong learner. The strong learner receives epsilon and delta, any value between zero and one, samples a sufficiently large number of examples. And so this is for the uh, strong learner part, it's just samples a sufficiently large number of examples, and then it's going to exploit the weak learner, sending the set F S of examples, modifying the distribution as shown before, fixing delta this way, and just combining the hypothesis. And if you consider this time the number of iterations that you have to carry out for AdaBoost to comply with the pack learning model, actually you can see, you have here a summary, so you can see that it's actually not going to be very, very large, assuming that, again, your weak learner is actually a, a very weak learner, typically. Uh, typically returns description variables, for example, or small decision trees that would be the same. So what we have seen from AdaBoost so far, to summarize, it di directly minimizes not the zero one loss, but an upper bound of this loss and the risk, corresponding risk, I will call it in general a surrogate risk, meaning you compute the expectation of something which just upper bounds the zero one loss. And we have this guaranteed convergence rate under the weak learning assumption. Very fast, exponentially fast. Question, can we do better? Well, if you do better, NP is in the set of determinist, deterministic algorithm whose time is just slightly more than polynomial, which is, again, not believed to be true. So 
doing significantly better than this convergence rate is just impossible. Right? So it's not only an algorithm which transforms a weak learner into a strong one, right? a weak classifier into a strong one, more, but it's also doing it in an optimal computational fashion. Remember, the computational part of the PAC model was typically the bottleneck. Right? So, to finish this summary, and then I will finish for this part, so AdaBoost is a formal boosting algorithm, and virtually its convergence rate is typically unbeatable under the weak learning assumption. And it induces a linear separator. Yes, so that's good, but you know, we are at an age where data domains are becoming bigger, and typically, well, a linear separators with a weak learner that just returns features it may not be really interesting. So we would typically want to have boosting algorithms for more architectures, and I will just detail them afterwards. So I'm um, wondering if there's any questions for the first part of the talk? Someone, yep. Empirically speaking, from the uh, PAC standpoint, what's reasoning in the PAC model, right? You have other models, I will talk a bit about that later. But reasoning from the PAC model, what you would do typically is uh, take a weak learner, which is a bit more complex than just features, but still tractable to do exhaustive, uh, exhaustive search. So this is the way you would put your weak learner in between uh, triviality and uh, hardness of uh, finding classifiers, right? So something that is big enough to be, uh, to be uh, exhaustively uh, searched. And then it depends on your computer. Any more questions? Yes, actually, the, there is also an epsilon outside. Okay. It's in the uh, dots. Right. Okay, so I guess this is the um, first round of questions. I'll see you in 20 minutes. Um, 10, 2, 3, we'll be back in the same room. See you guys. <coughs> Okay, thank you. So, to start this second part, in this second part, at the beginning of this second part, my objective is to show you that you can easily craft other boosting algorithms for different kinds of architectures. And I'm going to give you one example, which is about some very famous other kinds of boosting algorithms. Okay, so the point is that actually we can devise boosting algorithms for many other architectures. I've given you some examples at the beginning of this talk, but you can imagine for your problem variations around the representation that would be more suited, more useful for your particular problem. I'm going to give you one example for an architecture which is totally different from linear separators. And uh, it, in this case, it's going to be decision trees. So it turns out that there exists also some formal boosting algorithms for decision trees. These algorithms, you probably know them, these are CART or C4.5, the two most popular ones. How do they proceed? So they proceed in a very simple way. So for now, we just temporarily forget linear separators. So they induce the decision tree in a top-down fashion, typically inducing the tree from scratch. You have an empty tree first, and Predictions are made at the leaves, so your first decision tree is just a single leaf, which is going to make a constant prediction for all your training sample. Then you replace this leaf by a split, which is a stump in this case, a decision tree with one internal node. And you go on with this process, uh, repeatedly replacing one leaf by a decision stump. 
And what these algorithms would do, so CART, C4.5, they would typically minimize a function which is an expectation of, I would call that an entropy sometimes, but it's a function which is computed at the level of each leaf, taking into account the proportion of examples of one class relatively to the size of the leaf. Right? It turns out that taking the positive class or the negative class makes no difference at all because the function is symmetric, phi, symmetric sorry, in, the, in the sense that phi of x equals phi of 1 minus x. So taking the positive or the ne negative example is not going to make a difference. So they just repeatedly minimize the average of this kind of entropic function which depends just locally on the proportion of examples of one class that fall into this leaf, right? A very important point, which seems to be a key reason why these algorithms work, is this function is not con convex, it's concave, right? And in the same way as the exponential of, of theta boost was a surrogate, an upper bound of the 0-1 loss, this is the same property that holds for these functions. They are concave, but still upper bounds of the empirical 0-1 loss. Let's say 0-1 loss, right? So, to summarize, we induce the tree in a top-down fashion. We repeatedly minimize the expectation of a concave function, which is computed at the level of each leaf, taking into account the proportion of examples that come to this leaf. Typically, we want this proportion to go either to 0 or to 1 locally. The tree is all the better in this case. And it turns out that this function in this case goes to 0. Right? So minimizing this implies fitting a tree in which the leaves are going to be progressively more and more pure, containing examples of just one class, which is what we want. We want a tree that makes no or, let's say, little errors. Okay, so certainly... Ada boost does not seem similar to C4.5, CART, uh, all these families of decision tree learning algorithms, uh, in the same way as a linear separator does not look like a decision tree, right? So when you look at these algorithms, I have actually given you the algorithm in the preceding slides, uh, you have no weights, while well, you have weights in Ada boost, right? And uh, in Ada boost, we induce a linear separator minimizing a convex uh, surrogate. In decision trees, we minimize a concave surrogate of the empirical risk. And of course, once again, the representation is very different. Well, let's have a look. Uh, let's look a bit closer into the way we can represent a decision tree. You have here a decision tree. So at the internal nodes, you have representation variables, splits, are based on binary, in this case, Boolean tests over the values of the variables. You have leaves that make the prediction. We can replace a tree by a classifier which has this architecture. In each leaf, in each um, vertex, sorry, you are going to put a real value and not just at the leaves, right? You keep the splits. So basically, you keep the same path to classifier observation, but the classification, you are going to do it not just taking into account the leaf, but taking into account the sum of the values that go to this leaf, right? There's this kind of classifier is no different from a decision tree because you can aggregate at a leaf the sum of the values in the path that goes from the root to the leaf, and you obtain just a regular decision tree with the important difference that the predictions are not anymore minus one or plus one, they are just real values, but it's not a problem. The sign would give you a class, right? So let's assume that we replace this tree by putting real values everywhere and classifying an observation, summing the real values. And because these real values are, can be any uh, real, assume that we can fit something inside, which is the computation of leveraging coefficients in such a way that the prediction for a leaf is obtained following a linear classifier with constant features. 
right? And this is equivalent to that. There's no difference. Once again, the only difference is the value at the leaves, but the sign of it gives a class. Let's use AWS to fit this tree. Let's use AWS to fit this tree in the particular, in the particular, we are going to fit this tree. So fitting this tree is, consists of two parts, deciding the splits, right? And then finding, we assume that H is going to be given, for example, by a weak learner. And we just have to compute the alphas. So we have two problems, computing the alphas, deciding the splits, right? Computing the alpha, we can do that with data boost, right? Because what you have from the root to a leaf is just a linear se separator, right? So we run ADA boost, but if we minimize the same exponential loss, you have to remark that there will be a big difference with, let's say, the usual weight modification on ADA boost. And it's not only the fact that the weak uh, hypotheses are just constants, it's the fact that each, at each leaf you have just a subset of examples, right? So a leaf classifies a subset of examples, not the complete set, as we do a conventional linear separator. So weight modification is going to occur essentially, normalization is going to put that for all examples, but essentially it's going to be focused on a subset of S, right? And then normalization, we just put back the weights to one. Okay? So each of these alphas will bring a normalization coefficient z, right? And because these are linear separators, we will still be able to have this property for the upper bound of the exponential loss, right? Which is not going to be just the product of the z. It's going to be a combination of products of a Z because we have different ways, different linear separators, right? So the question is, if we adopt ADA boost to fit these values, okay, so we, minima we minimize the exponential loss. Reasonably, we have solved the problem of computing the alphas. How do we do the splits? Well, let's just minimize this criterion again, right? We just compute the splits. When one split is done, we have three leaves, three weight modifications, and we just decide for the one that's going to be the largest decrease to Z, right? Or equivalently, let's say, for the exponential loss, okay? So deciding the splits is basically minimizing the exponential loss over not one iteration, but several iterations, right? If you replace one leaf by three, this is three iterations. Right? So you have to look forward to decide the split. It's no big deal. It's no big deal because I don't want to give you a new boosting algorithm. As well. I want to give you the equivalent boosting algorithm to this one. And we are going to compute this algorithm. Okay, so let's minimize the exponential loss. So when you look at a leaf, we have, again, when we have put this new leaf, we have a weight update which is essentially focusing on this leaf. Because this leaf, so the H corresponding to this leaf, classifies just a subset of the examples. So WT is going to become WT plus 1 following ADA boost update. And we can thus seek to minimize the exponential loss. And because it's convex, just put the, compute the solution alpha in the same way as we would do for ADA boost. Let's do that. Right. So. We want to solve this equation, which is basically equivalent to computing a gradient step with a particular length for the step. So if you do that, remember that the classification on this leaf, the classifier here is constant, right? So everybody receives the same value locally for this leaf. So if we want to compute this derivative here, this is the explicit, uh, uh, the expression that you obtain, which depends on the current weights, aggregates also the value of h. We can drop h because it can, it can be 1. We can assume it's going to be 1 because alpha is going to balance that, right? So we can just put 1. Why not? So we can just drop ht in the expression, 
not going to be any uh, different. It's different from zero, obviously. And here you have the exponential with minus alpha and h, which is a, again going to be a constant. So I can keep the exponential minus alpha here, exponential alpha here. So we can, after having dropped the ht here, we can simplify this expression, put on one side the examples that are positive in the leaf, on the other side the examples that are positive in the leaf, right? When you look at these expressions, so these, this is ensured by the solution alpha. So picking alpha is going to ensure that after the weight update, just after the weight update, in the new distribution, locally in this lift, in this leaf, sorry, and relative to the current weights, not the initial weights that are uniform, relative to the current weight, there will be half, half positive, negative examples after the weight update, which is a property that I already stated for linear aspirators. There's no difference, right? Let's have a look at what this means. So that means that if we compute this quantity here, it's going to be zero after the weight update, because it's just the ratio of the two total weights for class plus, class minus, these two weights are equal, right? This is here the sum of the weights at iteration t plus one for the complete set of positive examples that reach this leaf, right? And same for the negative examples. Again, these two quantities are equal. This is zero. Let's compute in another way this value. And for that, let's consider the prediction for one positive example which arrives at leaf t. What is happening for this example? So you have its new weight after the weight update, which is going to be unraveled in the same way as it is in ADA boost, because there is absolutely no difference. So you have his new weight, which depends on that, and when we just unravel WT, replacing it by WT minus 1, WT minus 2, etc., W1, which is supposed to be uniform again. When you simplify this, you obtain an expression which is central to compute the convergence rate of ADA boost on training. It's just a bit more complex in this case. It's a bit more complex because you have in the denominator here not the complete product of all leveraging coefficients. You have just the product of, of all leveraging coefficients that would typically uh, uh, concern the computation of this leaf. So we compute the weights, right? We compute the product, sorry, of the normalization coefficients for the examples that come to this leaf and actually because each of these examples, right, receive this kind of modification for all these iterations, right? So then, here, you have the total weight for the plus one examples and the total weight for the minus one examples. Let's compute this quantity. So if we compute this quantity, we have that, so this is again zero, we replace that by the expressions before. So this is just the log of the cardinal of the two uh, classes locally, assuming the initial distribution is uniform again, and minus two times this quantity. But this quantity is just the prediction on the example that is achieved when this example goes through the root to the leaves of the tree, right? So we can simplify this using the fact that this is zero and actually the prediction achieved by this algorithm is one half of the log of the positive examples divided by the negative examples, right? Okay, so if I summarize, let's go back here. If I summarize, the prediction achieved at this leaf here does not depend on weights, right? I can directly compute the predictions. I don't care about weights. What about 
the exponential loss. And if you know decision tree induction algorithms, right, this quantity may be familiar already. But let's keep on working on this kind of uh, surrogate, convex surrogate of the 0, 1 uh, loss. Right. So, computing this, we know that this expression is actually can be decomposed because there are basically as many ways to classify an example as you have leaves. You have no more ways. So we just sum over the leaves of basically the proportion of the leaf, the weight of the leaf relative to the sample times these exponential losses, right? Each of which aggregates a classifier or classifiers that do not depend on weights. Let's simplify the expression. If we simplify this expression, what do we have? Here, we have a sum over the leaves, right, of the weight of the leaf times two times the square root of this quantity, which is a probability, it's in zero one, times 1 minus this quantity. And actually, when you put that into a more, um, a more synthetic uh, form, we obtain that the expectation of the exponential loss is actually equal to the expectation computed over the leaves of this function, which is 2 times the square root of x1 minus y. So you have this function here. This function computed over, basically, these probabilities that are just the proportion of examples that fall truly into a leaf. Right? And this is just... So once again, we have here, at the left, a function which is convex. And here, a function which is concave, not in the same parameters, of course, but at least in the interesting parameters, right? That actually belong to the minimization. So, if I summarize, we predict at the leaves something that looks like one half of the log of S, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not S plus over S, S minus one, it's S here, it's ST, I have to, uh, to, I have to uh, correct that. So, we have something, a prediction at the leaf, no, it's, no, no, it's S plus divided by S minus, sorry. So we predict at this leaf this real value, which does not depend on weights. And the algorithm, as we have computed it and simplified it, repeatedly minimizes the expectation of this entropy, which depends only upon the leaves, upon the examples arriving at each leaf. And again, no weight appears. What do we get if we aggregate the values along the paths in the same way as I did at the beginning? We get just a regular decision tree, right? What is this algorithm? Well, it's just an algorithm for the, from the CART C4.5 family. It's exactly the same kind of algorithm. Basically, here you minimize, I just rapidly brief this kind of algorithms. We repeatedly minimize an expectation of an entropy here, minus an entropy, okay, which is a function which is convex, uh, sorry, concave in its argument. And the only difference between CART and C4.5, if I don't consider the pruning stage of the, of the trees, the only difference for, uh, in the induction of the large tree is just the splitting criterion, right? Here we get a splitting criterion, which is actually different from that of CART and C4.5, right? Uh, C4.5 would use the binary entropy. CART would, would use Gini uh, entropy, Gini criterion. And this criterion here, the uh, two times the square root of uh, Z1 minus Z, actually was first analyzed in quite an old paper now. And they proved that so if you take phi here for CART splitting criterion, C4.5 splitting criterion, or the one I presented, right? So again, let's write it. I would call it phi m, 
Okay? So, I call it phi M for M for Matsushita because actually it was proposed in the 50s in a slightly different context. It was proposed in the early 50s to, 50s to compute classification rules. So, and it's exactly the same criterion, basically. The context is a bit different. So, they analyzed this criterion here as a splitting criterion, and they proved, it's a long proof, that it's a boosting algorithm, right? The decision tree induction following the repetitive minimization of this criterion is a formal boosting algorithm. Formal in the pack sense, which means if you make weak assumptions about a weak learner that you would use, you know, what is the weak learner? We'll see what is it. In fact, it's very simple. It's the, the algorithm that gives you the stumps, right? If you make very weak assumptions that totally comply with the boosting models, that makes a difference with the random coin by at least this advantage, gamma, then you have a boosting algorithm, right? And they also showed that CART and C4.5, not considering the pruning stage again, are also boosting algorithms. What they showed is also that this criterion here is optimal. And they gave an argument which is not computational, but is more informational. And so remember, we derived this, the minimization of this criterion from AdaBoost, for which we could show it's also optimal from a computational standpoint, right? So you have a different argument to show that basically the same kind of algorithm is just a transformation of AdaBoost to fit a different architecture. The same kind of algorithm is also optimal in this conte context, which makes sense, right? And CART and C4.5 are also boosting algorithms that are just a bit less efficient, meaning you, ha you will have to do more iterations, and so in this case, have a larger tree to satisfy the boosting requirements. Larger tree because, again, your weak learner returns stumps that you put in your tree, right? So the more calls you make, the larger is your tree. Okay, so now the question is, uh, uh, can we prove, but using ADA boost analysis, that these are boosting algorithms? Well, you can work out the equations. Actually, it works. It works. Well, the proof is going to be significantly shorter than the proof of, of Kearns and Mansour, but the convergence rate that we obtain is not as good as there, typically, right? Because there are some approximations. So I just gave this in two slides. I'm not going to... Okay, so the principle is just, as in AdaBoost, computing the exponential loss as a function of the products of the normalization coefficients. And then, basically, just computing the overall uh, value of the, exponential, uh, of the exponential risk surrogate using not the product of all z, but the expectation of the product of z in each path of the tree. And then, whoops, you compute exactly the value of z, you aggregate, simplifying the expression, you obtain an expression that depends on this function here. The weak learning assumption, so I'm just giving you the steps, right? So it's just an example. The weak learning assumption, so, is just going to receive a subset of all examples because in the tree, each uh, leaf classifies just a subset of the examples. Okay, so it just returns a constant. Right? So assuming, basically, that it's not an unbiased score in the constant, it's not zero. Right? And so what you are going to obtain is this kind of guarantee, which is actually the weak learning assumption for decision trees, and which is actually equivalent to the one done by Kearns uh, and Manso in their paper. And then you just have to work out the, uh, the maths. So here, the, the bounds are very crude. They are not meant to be optimal at all. It's just to give you one example of what can be done. In this case, you basically are going to uh, progressively upper bound Z by a quantity which is, again, as in AdaBoost, uh, 
a function of the exponential of minus 2 gamma squared, because at the end we are going to make products, so it's going to be very convenient. In this case, we just have here a division by a parameter which is actually the index of the iteration with which you obtain the leaf. So this is going to, uh, to reduce the convergence of the in the analysis, right? But we can still obtain some decent uh, inversely polynomial convergence, which is significantly small, uh, worse than ADA boosts. But I mean, it's just to give you one example. And more precisely, to give you an example of what we can do with a boosting algorithm to obtain other boosting algorithms for different kinds of representation, right? And actually, we generalized this observation in the case of AdaBoost. And uh, I will just talk a bit about that later. So you have this kind of parallel, not just between AdaBoost and this uh, algorithm, which is Kearns and Mansour's algorithm. You have a parallel also between different kinds of losses and CART and C4.5 as well. So all these algorithms are actually, they are not uh, far away neighbors. They are actually very similar, depending on the way you induce the classifier, right? So it's some sort of very malleable analysis that can fit to a lot of different architectures and with which you can actually prove that you have boosting algorithms. And what is good is that this is constructive again because using one algorithm you obtain uh, the algorithm to induce another representation, in our case decision trees. So, and the analysis exploits the analysis of the first boosting algorithm is some sort of reduction. Once again, the bounds are not very, uh, very good, but they are sufficient. And actually, so uh, remember Ada Boost and this Kearns and Manso algorithm are very similar. So basically, you can consider that when you run Ada Boost with linear combination of decision trees that are inferred using Kern and Mansour algorithm, it's almost the same algorithm. If you permute the classifiers, as I told at the beginning of this talk, then actually you have quite an efficient algorithm, which is a boosting algorithm for oblique decision trees, right? And it's the, the, uh, the same, or let's say a very similar mechanism for the induction of the classifier. And you can do that for alternating decision trees as well. And you can do that for well, branching programs, it's actually even simpler, but the analysis is a bit more, tr uh, it's a bit trickier. Uh, for all the, uh, all the representation, all the formalisms I presented at the beginning of this talk, actually, you can work out a boosting algorithm using these very simple considerations. So, one key, again, approach in AdaBoost, and by extension in this decision trees algorithm, is that the key to the minimization of the empirical risk is actually not the empirical risk, it's a surrogate, okay? In this case, it's a surrogate that involves a function, which is here the exponential loss. Question is, do we have other interesting loss, loss functions, right? With which we could replace the exponential loss by any other member of a bigger class. Right? And is there any meaning in to picking any other phi instead of just having in record time a classifier that's going to be consistent with your data? Is there any other rational to pick a different phi? Actually, you have many other interesting phi, and it turns out that for a wide subset of all these phi's, you have boosting algorithms. So, and the story starts with. Uh, a paper of 2006, which actually studied all, stu all these kind of functions and gives necessary and sufficient conditions for any of these phi's, so phi's replace the exponential loss in the expression, for any of these phi's to be interesting for classification. So what they did is actually consider, you put on the table all the risk we have considered so far. So what do we have? So on training, on testing, we have different values for this risk. And from the loss standpoint, we have two different expressions. So basically, 
Ada Boost, for example, is focusing on the minimization of this uh, loss here, okay? The, um, the uh, exponential surrogate, let's say this way. And actually what happens is that you are indirectly, because of the property of phi is involved, you are indirectly minimizing this function as well, right? Properties that involve both, let's say, the analytic properties of phi and also the properties of the classifiers that you build. You have to remember that in the, for the generalization part, you have some complexity-related parameters that come in the play, and you don't want to use two complex classifiers from the VC dimension standpoint, otherwise it's going to be very hard, actually. Right? But if your class of weak classifiers is not too large, reasonable, then actually minimizing this and doing this with Ada Boost is, can actually provide you with a good, very good procedure to minimize this one. So what happens if we replace phi here? So what they gave is a very important notion which is called classification calibration, which gives you conditions under which the minimization of the true, it's very important to notice here that we compute the, the loss over the true distribution, right? So they give conditions for which the minimization of your phi risk, okay, of a D, brings you the minimization of the true risk of a D, right? So you can replace phi by the exponential loss or by any other function. Some are better than others. We will see some examples. But until now, you can replace that by any other function. So they gave conditions for which the fact that the, the difference between your phi risk and the optimal phi risk, assume it's going to be for Bayes rule, for example, conditions for which these two risks converge to zero, of course there will be an algorithm in the play, is going to be to give conditions on the convergence of the true risk to the risk of Bayes rule, basically, right? Let's call this one the Bayes phi risk and this, call this one the Bayes risk. So what they prove is actually, if you call these quantities, so there are quite a lot of quantities, A, B, C, and D, they prove that there exists a function psi here, which is non-decreasing and have, has very interesting properties, for which psi of C minus D is actually no more than A minus B. Okay? So which means, because of the property of phi, that if this converges to zero in absolute value, then this also is going to converge to zero. Right? This is what we are going to see. And the way they did that was basically to reason not on the uh, complete domain, but locally. So classification calibration is a local property, form of a point-wise property. And for, to analyze all these functions, so they defined a first function that I called here u, which is just the infimum over alpha here, alpha real, of this quantity here, eta phi of alpha plus one minus eta phi of minus alpha, right? This quantity here, analytically, may seem a bit complicated, but if you consider that here, you're minimizing a phi risk, this, if you replace eta here by the conditional probabilities, probability of one given zero for eta, then this is just here, this process is just giving you the optimal value for classification, right? Without any more constraints, right? For phi classification, right? Because there's phi, right? It's not the zero one loss, right? And you define in the same way u minus, which is basically going to be the same problem with a constraint. The constraint is that alpha is going to be a diff of a different sign than two eta minus one. Right? And if you consider that 2 eta minus 1 is actually Bayes prediction, right? then what's happening here, and you can check that putting this value for eta, then what's happening here is that you force to make the wrong prediction. And still, you are minimizing this criterion, right? So here, it's a minimization without constraint. Here, it's a minimization under the constraint that you are doing the wrong classification. So, U of eta, once again, it's the 
optimal phi risk on a particular observation. Once again, it's a pointwise property. And u minus eta is the optimal phi risk, but optimal disagreeing phi risk on the same observation. And the Im very important definition, which may seem a bit obscure, is that your function is classification calibrated if this quantity u, so without the constraint, is strictly smaller than the other one, strictly smaller for, I didn't put that, I have to put that, for any eta different from one half. Right? There's no constraint on one half. So this function has to be strictly smaller than this one. And the theorem that they show throughout this notion of classification calibration is that you have the convergence of the phi risk to its optimal implies the convergence of the true risk to its optimal, by all, it's risk, right? If and only if, this is necessary and sufficient, your function phi is classification calibrated, if and only if this property is satisfied. So put on one slide may seem a bit obscure, but when we instantiate phi with particular values, problems become, the problem becomes a bit more, uh, let's say, a bit less obscure. Let's say it this way. So the proof, I'm not going to do the proof. So the proof basically exploits one important property, it's constructive. So once again, they give the particular value of psi, which actually depends, oh, I forgot to replace, no, that's fine, which depends on u minus and u here. So this is the value of, of psi, actually, with which you have the theorem I mentioned. So you have different properties that can be used. And at the end, what you have is that, so you have here, your function psi of this difference is no more than this difference. This is the difference between your true risk and bias. This is the difference between your true phi risk and bias phi risk, right? Which is exactly what we wanted, right? So to get the theorem, well, you have several properties to remark. In particular, and this is what I was stating, the value of psi in zero, it is zero, and otherwise it is strictly positive. And this is actually equivalent to stating classification calibration. So you can equivalently put a condition of a psi on psi here. And so basically what it says you is that if you have a sequence of classifiers boosting algorithms that progressively converges right to the minimum of any kind of phi risk, then on your whole domain, that's very important, right, on your whole domain, then this guarantees that the, your true risk is going to converge to bias risk as well, right? So you can basically focus on that knowing that this will happen if you manage to do that, right? So when phi is the exponential loss, which is classification calibrated. This, you have a very fast minimization algorithm, which is Ada boost. So the question is, do we have any other examples of such functions for which we have fast minimization algorithm? And it turns out that we have many other examples of such phi's. And basically, any proper loss, so a proper loss is basically just a loss which is minimized by, by, by is, which is minimized by Bayes rules. Okay, so any proper loss with identical class-wise misclassification costs, whether you class one positive example as negative or one negative example as positive, is going to make to, to have you incur the same loss, right? Admits a boosting algorithm and an efficient boosting algorithm, meaning that the convergence is not bad. Not as fast as Ada boost in the general case, but it's a good one. And it exploits some properties that you will see uh, a bit more in a talk to come uh, about Frank, which is actually the loss. Loss function so far for us is just something that we want to minimize. 
actually it induces a particular geometry, a particular geometry over the set of weights. The key point to analyze all these booting algorithms as one is weights, the weights. So you have a particularly, a particular, sorry, geometry on your set of weights, and boosting acts as a geometric game over this set of weights. So this is a game theoretic view of boosting, which is very popular. There is another one that I will give you in the following slides. So to detail a bit more the kind of phi that we can choose, then basically, if we consider any proper loss, okay? So once again, the loss is minimized by Bayes' rule, which is symmetric in the sense of classification, as I said before. Misclassifying a positive or a negative examples gives the same loss. And you have some differentiability conditions on your loss. Then basically, your loss has exactly the phi shape, right? And furthermore, so this is the phi shape, the one we minimize. If we look at the geometry behind, what happens is that this phi is proportional, hence there is no difference from the minimization standpoint, is proportional to a particular divergence notion between two quantities. The one is a class, but it's not a class in minus one, one, because if you do prediction in this case, uh, sorry, density estimation. The class you would put would be 0 for minus 1 and 1 for plus 1. So it's just basically class conditional uh, uh, estimation locally, right? To a negative example, actually you, are, you associate a 0 probability of positive class given the observation, right? And you give a 1 probability uh, for a positive example. So you map the classes in 0, 1. Right, which are the extreme values of this class conditional density estimation. And you have here another quantity which depends only on the classifier. The interesting part on that, which does not appear here, is that we split in the loss that we minimize what is in the data, the classes, and what is in the classifier, what we predict. Right? So here we are minimizing a divergence notion between classes, not encoded in minus one one, that's not a problem, and here, weights, because this is actually almost exactly the weight formalism as you have it in AdaBoost, right? And what AdaBoost is doing is basically just coming up with a classifier that's going to have this quantity here, the set of weights, converge to these values here, right? So, the key point, the other key point, is that for any loss that meets this property, you have a phi. The phi is equivalent, the phi loss is equivalent to this divergence. The di this divergence depends on a function which is different. And it's actually a function, if you look at it, it has exactly this way. So here and here, the domain of these two quantities are 0, 1. So this function has for, has her, her domain is actually 0, 1 also. This is convex, has this particular symmetric shape. And if you flip the function, then you recognize the entropies that are used in decision tree minimization, right? It's not uh, a chance because the, the parallel between boosting algorithms with linear separators like ADA boost and decision tree induction algorithms, like the one I did, like CART, C4.5, or the algorithm of Kern and Mansu, comes directly from this expression, actually. When we work this expression with here a linear separator, and here the linear separator, and we fitting a decision tree using the linear separator exactly in the same way as I presented. So, what is boosting doing? So remember, the key part of boosting I'm going to briefly describe the procedure and give a view of boosting, which is slightly different from game theory that you would see in many different papers, which is very appealing. It's a different view, which actually exploits more recent results. So your boosting algorithm builds a sequence of classifiers by aggregating weak classifiers. Equivalently, it repeatedly builds 
a vector of weights. Right? So these vector of weights, you can map them in a set which basically contains any possible weight for any possible classifiers. Right? You have to compute the closure of this set for technical reasons. So here, W bar is actually the closure of a set of weights. So this is, again, the complete set of weights that can be achieved by any of your classifiers, linear separators, or decision trees, if you want decision trees. And so boosting is actually, in the same way as you get a list, or AWS gets a list of classifiers, here you have progressively a point in this set that's going to move somewhere. What's happening is that this point, well, this is not about AWS, these are different kind of boosting algorithms that don't do the normalization. If you drop the normalization, then you get this family of algorithms. What they do is that they take a first weight, which is again usually uniform. So in this case, all the coordinates are constant. They do not necessarily sum to one. And they are all going to modify this set of weights to have it converge to a particular subset of the set of weights, which is basically the kernel of a linear operator that I will present afterwards, which depends solely on the edges, again, edges. And what is important is that in this set, at this intersection here for W infinity, Right? assuming you can boost forever, which nobody would do, but assuming we can do that, then you have this property here, which is met for this vector right, of weights, which is the final one. In Ada boost, you normalize the weights, so you wouldn't observe that. Right? But if you drop the normalization, this is what you would observe. So what does that mean? If you take any of these properties, it was actually recently proved, that if you care only about classification, right? So you have a huge set of data with the classes, right? M classes in your data. It turns out that this is not the sufficient and minimally sufficient information to build a, classi a classifier for, so to predict the classes, right? In statistics, when you have a quantity, well, like this one, this is going to be this one in this case, which is a sufficient estimator of another one, basically. That means that if you take the ratio of two likelihoods, of your two data, right, assuming they have the same value for this quantity, the dependencies on the one that you want to predict just drop down. They just vanish, right? So in this case, for any, um, any proper loss, what you can show is that there is a minimally sufficient information which is not the complete set of classes. It's called the mean operator. So it was first uh, stated, not this property, but the mean operator was first given in 2005 in a paper by De Freitas. And later on, uh, more analyzed by people from NICTA, actually. And this mean operator has this shape. So the mean operator is basically just the sum over all your examples of the class times the observation, and you normalize, right? So this is a quantity whose size is just the dimension of your domain, and this quantity is minimally sufficient, right? So you just need this to do classification. Equivalently said, if you have, let's say, um, two data sets for which uh, the mean operator here is the same, then basically you can minimize the, uh, your file loss. No, I'm not going to say that this way. Um, if you have Let's keep it this way. So this quantity here, the mean operator, is minimally sufficient, okay? Th which means that just for classification, not for boosting, if you know this value, its value, then actually you can, you can learn a classifier 
without knowing the classes. Right? Let's formulate it this way. If you know the min operator, you can build a classifier to minimize any file loss, by, and you can drop, actually, the classes from your data to learn this classifier. You don't need the classes if you know the min operator. Right? So this is a very important property. And what happens for all these family of boosting algorithms is that basically, at the end, when the convergence of the algorithm is achieved, you have the mean operator, which is not exactly this one because the weights are different. The weights is W infinity, right? But this weighted mean operator is going to be the null vector. So if you backtrack into the properties of the mean operator, that means that basically boosting is finding a set of weights that just exhausts the class information. Right? At the end of boosting, the mean operator is just the null vector. Right? So uh, you can find that in several papers, one of which is recent. So I will go a bit. How much time do I have? 15. Okay. So how do we uh, analyze these algorithms? And how do we prove that they are boosting algorithms? Then basically, you have the first step is that, remember the equivalence between the phi risk and this kind of divergence term? This kind of divergence term is not any distortion. It is a Bregman divergence. So you have here the expression of a general Bregman divergence. You would instantiate that with the little phi I gave in uh, the slide before, right? So your phi loss is equivalent from the minimization standpoint, optimization standpoint, equivalent to a Bregman divergence, right? Whose generator, this is the function that generates the divergence, whose generator is just this symmetric, entropic-like convex function, right? Minus. So to represent a Bregman divergence, well, uh, the representation is actually very easy to, uh, to visualize. You just plot your convex function. And if you want to compute the uh, divergence between W and W prime, you take the tangent to your curve, to a curve, sorry, in W prime, and the difference between the value of your curve and the value of the tangent in W. This is the divergence between the two points. Right? So you have a lot of very interesting properties for this set of distortion measures that are not metrics. And that turns out to be very crucial for this kind of algorithms. And you have many famous examples of Bregman divergences. The kullback libler divergence is a particular example. The Itakura-Saito divergence in, in signal processing is a particular uh, case. And even Malanobis, right, is also a particular case. I give them, I give here, sorry, the uh, generators for um, reals, but you can extend them actually for vectors. And this is where actually you get the full shape of Malanobis divergence. I won't write it here. So any Bregman divergence satisfies the identity of indiscernibles, right? They don't satisfy, except for one particular case, which is actually Malanobis. They are not symmetric, never symmetric, and do not satisfy in the general case the triangle inequality. So these are not metrics. So to drill down a bit more into the uh, equivalence I, I've put several slides before. So you have the following property here. Uh, your uh, expected phi risk is actually equal to the divergence between zero and the weights and something that does not depend on your data, right? So, and this is there that we are going to work to work out the boosting algorithm. So I have included here this function, the small phi function here, phi tilde, is not any function. It's actually the convex conjugate of this one, right? It's obtained from the convex conjugate. A particular operation to make. The sign here, which is important. Let's have a look at this linear operator. So we are going to store in this matrix the complete set of edges. And this is what is central to boosting algorithms. This matrix, which stores for every example in each row, the classification of any of your weak classifiers. So here in this case, you certainly have 
to consider that your complete set of weak classifiers is finite, right? So to make this analysis. But I have no problem because with all the examples I've shown is the case. So there are two important quantities that aggregate the edges. So the edge of your complete classifier of a one example and the edge of one weak classifier of your complete set of examples. So what you can show is basically that starting from an initial classifier, your boosting algorithm is going to converge to this point here, which turns out to be, this can be shown, equivalent if you put an H inside, the H that gives you this weight, set of weights, which we don't know, right? But it exists for sure. Then actually the classifier is optimal, right? Because of this relationship, right? And this is a Bregman divergence. So you have an interesting property in this case, which is basically that the divergence from zero to any vector, which is equivalent to the loss that you minimize, is the same as the divergence from zero to W infinity, which corresponds to the loss of the optimal classifier, plus this quantity, which is also a divergence. So this is a Bregman Pythagoras theorem. And this is useful to show that W infinity corresponds to the optimal classifier because of this relationship. It's also useful actually to build the algorithm because what the algorithm, what the algorithm is going to do is progressively, so I'm just going to, okay, is basically going to progressively find a new set of weights that's not going to be in this kernel because it may be very hard actually to fit all the leveraging coefficients at once. This, this particular kind of boosting algorithm is called totally corrective boosting algorithms. So in general, it's a bit tricky. So it's basically going to, f to fit a vector in a kernel for a restricted matrix, right? And it's going to be repeatedly doing that. And what we can show is that it's going to converge to this one, to this particular weight vector, and thus the classifier is going to, uh, to converge to the optimal classifier for any phi, right? So what we can show is that, so when there is no more update on the alphas, so the algorithm is basically going to update the alphas exactly in the same way as ADA boost, right? So at the end, what we can show with this chain of uh, identities, equivalence, is that when you can't do any more update, so basically you have exhausted the weak learner because this is going to happen, at this time, your classifier is actually the optimal one, right? Meaning that this uh, classifier achieves the minimal uh, phi risk over your training data. That's very important, right? So you have converged to actually the global optimum of your phi risk over your training data. Well, to be a boosting algorithm, we need a bit more. We need convergence rates. And actually, we can also show convergence rates. And all this paper actually aggregates different results. We can show that basically you have this quantity, which is actually the step size to progressing to the minimal value of the uh, expected phi risk, right? This quantity is actually lower bounded by a quantity which depends on several parameters, but also on the weak learning parameters. And the dependency is, well, not the best possible. It's certainly not as efficient as ADA boost, but it's a boosting algorithm, right? So if we just put more constraints on the number of examples that we have to sample prior to running this, this kind of algorithm, then we get a formal boosting algorithm. So you have this couple of papers that present some, some of these boosting algorithms. So once again, what we can show is that the correspondence between linear separators and decision trees from the induction standpoint that I just uh, that I showed for ADA boost actually works for any proper loss. And for any proper loss, you would obtain equivalently the minimization of this expected entropy, negative entropy here, right? Which would always be concave. And actually, in this case, we get the exact correspondence between CART C4.5 and particular phi's. And actually, CART 
Oh, it's the contrary, sorry. C4.5 corresponds to the uh, logistic loss here, and CART corresponds to the square loss, right? So, so basically, to summarize, we have many interesting losses. They all yield efficient boosting algorithms. Basically, we can boost any proper loss. So each of them actually works not, not exactly on the um, zero one loss, but works with a surrogate function which depends on an edge. So an edge gives you with this sign whether your example is, receives the right classification or not, but it gives you more actually. And so far the theory of boosting is pleased because we have boosting algorithms. But when we look at experiments, we, show, we can see from experiments that actually more is achieved than what just boosting would require. And if you take any uh, kind of these pictures, this is taken from this very uh, fundamental paper of uh, Chapri, Freund, Bartlett, and Lee, then what you can see in this case, basically, if you still carry out ADA boost with decision trees, you measure your training error. So, of course, as I said, boosting, ADA boost, converge to, in this case, to uh, a consistent classifier. They use uh, not decision stumps, right? So we converge to a consistent classifier. Usually, when you boost for a very long a number of iterations, remember that you don't usually control the size of your learning sample. You have to be very careful about the complexity of your model because you may overfit your data, right? So you have to be very careful not to build a too complex model. Turns out in this case, if you look at the generalization error, after the training error has reached zero, so there is nothing more to, to do for classification, your test error continues to decrease. And actually the algorithm does not overfit. So there is an explanation in this phenomenon that does not belong to the previous set of slides, right? And this is what I was about to uh, present now, because what is actually happening is when you boost, using a boost, for example, you just don't minimize this, the event where the sign of Y is not equal to the same sign of H. You actually minimize the occurrence of a lot of more interesting, actually, events from a generalization standpoint this time which is actually you are minimizing not just the fact that H and Y don't have the same sign, you minimize the, the event that actually the product of the two is no more than some theta. And if you consider that theta is going to be positive, which is the most interesting, interesting case, that means that when this is zero, you don't only give the right classification, but you give the right classification with a value of H which is large. And the intuition which can be a bit formalized, is that your classifier is more confident in this classifier, classification, right? So good classification should be achieved not only caring about just the labels, but also about the magnitude of the classification, which is this notion of confidence. And, well, I was about to present you the way it plays more in particular ways, right? But, well, I guess I will stop there. So thank you very much. The set of slides will be... Um, Available soon, so you can see the uh, quite some. Uh, okay, so questions, please. So the fact is that you have one model, right? So you have induced only one model. Your model is complex, right? It has been obtained by an iterative procedure, 
perhaps. What boosting says is that your iterative procedure may be actually a boosting algorithm. If you don't build a classifier all in one shot, right, which would still be equivalent to totally corrective boosting, right? Let's assume we don't work in that, right? If you, if you, if you have an iterative algorithm, then it may, be, it may well be the case that it's actually a boosting algorithm, so you can prove this kind of results, right? You just have to really be careful about the way you, you optimize your function. The point is that this is just convex optimization at the end. More questions? Okay, so uh, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit of um, what happens when um, there's noise in your training data. So when you have maybe outliers on your classification, uh, how does boosting cope with this um, noise on the um, training data? Uh, that's a very good question, actually, because um, it, is, uh, it is believed but challenged. <coughs> more believed than challenged, actually, that boosting is sensible to noise. So um, when you have typically noise in your data, you have to be careful about the weak learner, in particular, and the leveraging coefficients. Also, if for some reason the noise actually is able to produce weak classifiers that are consistent and you apply a boost, then you have infinite leveraging coefficients. And of course, this is just the result of noise. So you have to be very careful about that, right? So typically, you would either control your leveraging coefficients or you would put, this is what I said, um, said at the beginning, you would actually regularize your loss. Um, there are different solutions. But sometimes, apparently, boosting is actually not a very good way to cope with noise. <coughs> I think it depends on the classifier also that you're using. So this view is quite common. It has been challenged. You can see uh, one GMLR paper, 2000. It's in the bibliography. It's here. Evidence contrary to the statistical view of boosting. Well, you have several of these uh, kind of popular views that are challenged, including noise, uh, density estimation. Any more questions? Yeah. No, no, it's, ju it's just that if you suspect that you, you have noise, which is in general to, going to be the case, you have to be careful about the weak learner and you have to be careful about the boosting algorithm that you, uh, you are using. You have to be careful about the alphas and uh, typically you would just uh, clamp bound the alphas. Uh, you would regularize your loss. Uh, you would... But then, when you regularize your loss, the analysis is a bit different. So sometimes you, you end up with something that you don't know it, if it's still a boosting algorithm, right? But if it works well, I mean, you are focusing on a particular problem. So the, the point is the problem, not just the, the general theory. So in this case, you can pay the price, basically, to add these different things that weaken the, the model, but actually get, uh, make you get a, a stronger algorithm for your domain. Uh, just one more thing, you have to be careful about yeah, the weak learner and in particular the, weak, the, the way the weak learner actually builds the weak hypothesis, right? You have to be careful about the set of weak hypotheses that you use in this case. It's a bit... Uh, sorry? Uh, sometimes, yes. This is one... Uh, uh, there is a the popular belief is actually boosting does not tend to overfit, right? So, but it's sometimes it's clearly overfitting, and uh, then what you have no very it's very different from the optimization standpoint, the learning sample standpoint where everything is clear. The statistical standpoint, I mean, see the, the title of this paper, Evidence Contrary to the Statistical View of Boosting. When you reason about generalization, 
uh, you know, no free lunch. Sometimes you get you know, a result that's going to, uh, to prove useful for your domain, sometimes not. So. Yep, over here. Uh, typically, in this case, you would modify the um, the, the matrix of um, of, uh, of losses. Uh, you wouldn't put a symmetric loss, a symmetric purple loss in this case, and uh, so you wouldn't get the algorithm exactly as it's stated here, right? You would typically put more emphasis on the minority examples. I mean, I assume these are very important, right? So, because from the classification standpoint, you can just get rid of these ones, right? If you have one negative example in your domain, you don't care about it. Yeah, I mean, if its weight is very small, it's not going to play any effect in the generalization error. You don't have to focus on this. If you do that, it's because for you, it's important, right? So in this case, typically the workaround would be to modify the, uh, either the, the weight at the beginning and then progressively for the boosting algorithm, uh, but there are other techniques in this case that would probably work, be competitive with boosting algorithms, perhaps better. Right. So. Okay. Um, any more questions? We are just in time. Yep. What's the best reference in the literature for converting an ensemble of boosted trees to one big tree? Uh, Did I say that? No, sorry. Um, so typically, so it means for the uh, kind of um, transferability of boosting algorithms from one formalism to another one. Uh, so basically, this kind of transfer was just proven for linear separators and decision trees. So in a huge class involving uh, CART, C4.5, logit boost, other boosting algorithms as well for phys. Uh, so you have it um, in actually in a paper I wrote with Frank in PAMI in 2009. Um, so so there's, there's just basically the high level um, equivalence, right? So there is no so far general uh, general kind of uh, convergence bounds that would directly map the algorithms from one another, directly map the weak learning assumption from one set of hypotheses to another one, you have seen that the weak learning assumption is different, actually, for decision trees than it is for linear separators, right? So. Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> and um, one last announcement for those of you um, um, that don't know how to get to the lab, that didn't go yesterday for some reason, just find someone who knows how to get there <laughs> and let them guide you, okay? So, see you tomorrow. <laughs>